Welcome to E3, Energy and Efficiency with Emily, Episode 6, Adding Value to Your Land. Uh, joining us today is our friend and colleague, Bob Barry, owner of Mainland Development Consultants. Um, they're here to help you understand, develop, and protect your land. So welcome, Bob. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about Mainland. Well, hi there. Uh, yeah, I'm Bob Barry uh, with Mainland. Our company helps people add value to their land. Uh, and we do that uh, with uh, anything uh, technically related to your land. So we have civil engineers on staff, uh, we have uh, surveyors on staff, and environmental sciences on staff. Uh, we help people protect their land. So we work for a whole bunch of land trusts uh, that want to know where their boundaries are, want to know what they have on their land. Um, we work for uh, municipalities with the people's land, working on their roads, working on their parking lots, or anything municipally owned, water systems, sewer systems, things like that. Uh, and, and private landowners, lots of private landowners, residential, commercial, industrial, whatever it's needed. Uh, we work with regulators, we work with contractors uh, and owners to pull together everything needed outside of the building envelope. That's really cool. We, uh, we've been talking a little bit, you know, it's uh, building season here in Maine, uh, and we've uh, been doing some uh, house siting and orientation, and uh, um, not that you know it was building season. Did you guys get snow today? Uh, we didn't get any snow here on the coast, but it's pretty cold. Um. It's cold and rainy here, and it's supposed to snow. I haven't seen it yet, and I'm not I'm not holding my breath. I think it will miss us. But I saw pictures of snow just north of here. Yeah. So I'm. I said I think we woke up in March. We went to bed last night. It was May. We woke up. It was March this morning. Um, but for this time of year, we get a lot of questions or people, you know, breaking ground. So I thought this is kind of the opportune time to have uh, someone like yourself come on and talk about, you know, land development and conservation. And um, you know, Maine has a lot of land and not so many people still for right now, which is great. Um, and, you know, for us with energy and efficiency, how we can kind of sustainably develop uh, property and, you know, what goes into that. So I know you have a uh, um, common, you know, one of the things we talked about is common setback issues, you know, th things that you typically find, you know, for us, we do a lot of residential, but for you guys, you do residential and commercial. So what are some of the typical things that you find on projects or that could be sort of useful for someone to think about beforehand, before they call you? <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, and, and what I'd like to touch on today is some, at a high level, some of those things that you should think about or that could bite you later if you don't think about, um, and, uh, and sometimes years later. So I'll, I'll touch on all of those. I'm gonna touch on them on a high level. Uh, and then if we wanna get into the weeds on any of these, um, we can at a later date. Be yeah, glad. absolutely. All right, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is simply your boundary lines. Uh, every piece of property that you own is going to have edges. Uh, it, and, and you don't own the world. Uh, not yet, Emily, you might get there. I'm working uh, on it, world uh, domination. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you think you might know where those property lines are. Your neighbor thinks they know where the property lines are, but sometimes that's not the same line. Uh, and people get a little crazy about their property. Uh, they should because here in America we get to actually own our own land. Uh, so uh, we get crazy about it. We get crazy about where the line actually is. And uh, if your neighbor and you don't agree on where that line is, then you need something like a survey to go out and, uh, and find that. Um, you can get the information on tax maps, and I just want to caution on tax maps. Tax, map, tax maps have one purpose, really, and one purpose only, and that is to tell the town how much to tax you. That's why they're called tax maps. Uh, so, so it's a good general view of where your boundaries might be uh, on a tax map, uh, but they are not uh, accurate a lot of the times. Um, sometimes they're not updated. The town may not get the information to update them. The town might not be diligent about, about updating them. Uh, the town might not have somebody uh, that's good with maps and knows how to update them. Yep. So tax maps have limitations. You just got to be careful with those. Uh, we start there and then move on. Um, yeah. If you get a mortgage, you get something called a mortgage loan inspection, which is also not a survey. A mortgage loan inspection is only there. It looks like a survey because there's a plan, has a house yeah. on it with a property line. Uh, but it's not actually a survey because its only purpose is to give a high degree of certainty not certainty, but a high degree uh, or a low degree of risk to a bank 
that the house that they're financing is actually on the property. Yeah, and I appreciate you bringing that up and talking about that because we have that conversation a lot, you know, where someone uh, bought a house and they say, well, I have this survey. And I'm like, well, a mortgage survey is not the same thing as an actual survey. And in some cases, uh, I had another architect in a forum that I uh, participate in say they had a boundary survey and they were like, this isn't good enough. They asked the contractor to do a survey. He didn't know what to ask for and ended up with another mortgage survey uh, and not a boundary survey. And the two surveys were more than 20 feet off of each other. Um, and still they didn't have the survey that said, this is where the house actually is kind of on the property and adjacent to your property line. So I appreciate that you touch on that, um, which is not all surveys are created equal or the same thing or meant to do the same thing. That, that's right. Um, mortgage loan inspections are, are everybody likes them because they're cheap. I'm talking about hundreds of dollars, um, but but all, all they're intended to do is reduce the bank's risk that they're not buying a house with a property line through it. Right. And if the house is within the bounds of the property, that's all they care about, and done. Right. Um, so if you really want to know what the line is, then you have to hire a surveyor and get that surveyor's opinion. Occasionally, two surveyors don't agree where that line is, but generally they do, uh, and and then you can establish that that line. Right. Just and then and when we talk about setbacks, and I'll talk about setbacks next. But when it comes to property line setbacks, that's the line that governs. And 20 feet is a big deal, like you mentioned. If that property line is 20 feet different than what you thought, and then you pull a 50 foot setback and build your house there, well, you might find yourself 10 foot in 10 foot inside that setback after construction. Right. Um, and I have literally seen someone lop a corner off of a house for that very issue. Yeah, or we've had people uh, have to take it down, uh, you know, when they didn't meet uh, a requirement. And that's the last thing you want to do is take the one thing you're probably going to spend the most money on in your lifetime and then have to take it down. It's not like mm -hmm. you can just pick it up and move it over. Like, oh, hard. piece of furniture, I didn't like it here. I'm going to put it over there now. So. Pretty hard to pick up and move. Yeah. <laughs> not impossible, <Yeah>. but very <laughs> expensive. Yes. So that bounds your property, an important part of any part of land ownership. Um, when you're talking about setbacks, a setback to all sorts of things. Uh, to define a setback, uh, a setback is some sort of buffering area. It doesn't have to be natural buffer, though it might be. Uh, it could be lawn, it could be driveway. It just A setback is from whatever boundary we're talking about, whether it's a boundary line, property boundary line, or a wetland boundary line, or something like that. And then how far back before you can do whatever it is that you want to do. Um, so some common ones is towns will often have property line setbacks or road frontage setbacks. Um, sometimes don't, sometimes do. Uh, I work for hundreds of towns and they're all different. So yeah. you've got to go to your code enforcement officer, find out what those, those setbacks are uh, and plot them on the plan. Uh, and oftentimes the side yard setbacks will be different from the front setback, which will be different from the back line setback. So you got to plot all of those. And those are usually building setbacks, not development setbacks. So you might still be able to put your driveway through it, lawn, septic system, uh, et cetera, but your, your house, the, the structure itself, will have to be that far from the property line. Yeah, and you're talking about building setbacks and stuff, and so I know you guys also do subdivisions, and so subdivision setbacks I know are different. Um, we have a subdivision in, in Cumberland that uh, a builder is working on that um, we have a 75-foot buffer from the one side uh, you know and you can't put anything in the buffer you know no buildings no driveway no clearing you know no nothing and so um things like that kind of come into play too when you're you know, expanding beyond just one lot you now now you have multiple lots and um, i'm sure every town is different and what their requirements are it's kind of interesting we built on one side of the road we have a five lot subdivision if we had the same piece of property on the opposite side of the road we could have had 14 lots it's always amazing i mean it's the same road but yep. different you know different rules and requirements kind of inside and outside of of zone and you know like you said you got to talk to the town and find out what that is so yep. sometimes have zoning sometimes do not uh and uh and then sometimes some of those lot sizes are governed by the state not by the town uh and then some of the setbacks i'm about to talk to are state or even federal uh setbacks that you have to obey um there are Natural Resource Protection Act setbacks. So uh, every anything defined as a stream needs a 75-foot setback. 
if you happen to be in a, in a larger subdivision, it might be a hundred foot setback. And those are typically no touch buffers. Right. Um, you can have a winding path. You can do maintenance clearing. So if a tree's about to fall and it might hurt somebody, then you can cut those trees. But otherwise, you have to leave it native condition. Um, and, uh, and a stream is defined by DEP. Uh, and they're, they're, a stream is, is not what you picture as a stream. Uh, uh, well, let me back up. A stream that looks like what you picture as a stream, stream is certainly a stream. Um, but then <laughs> there are other things that are def regulatory streams that don't look like streams. Right. Um, sometimes a dry gully will actually be a stream. Uh, or uh, I have seen um, regulators define ditches and skitter ruts as streams in certain circumstances. Um, and so there's no water flow requirement there. So it can be just a little trickle and it might be a stream that needs a 75 foot setback. So it's tough. Do you find that there's a certain time of year where, you know, there are more, so, you know, you say a dry gully, like, you know, say it's August and it hasn't rained in, you know, weeks, something might be dry, but in the spring it could be, you know, running. Is there a time of year, you know, if, especially if you have a piece of property that you're not sure about that it is, you know, when the DEP wants to come and look at it, I mean, we ran into um, a, an interesting issue with a piece of property that um, the, when they redid the road work, the culvert was too high. And so then the water didn't run off of the piece of property and they actually created a wetland that didn't exist prior to, you know, but, and then the, they wanted to come out um, when, frogs were laying eggs or something this is sort of beyond my my skill uh, skill level and understanding i know you guys do a lot of environmental stuff to to test uh, all of that but you know is there a time of year that's really specific to the dep when they want to see some of these things yeah uh, i'll switch to the natural stuff um <laughs> so so there's in maine we have there's, there's all sorts of environmental uh, uh natural resources that are protected uh, that the, the state of Maine has determined have natural significance that doesn't belong to the landowner, it belongs to the state of Maine. Yeah. Uh, and in those areas, uh, your rights to your property are limited. Mm -hmm. um, right or wrong, that's the way, that's the, way the, the laws are written. Uh, and the, the big three that we deal with most are wetlands, streams, and vernal pools. Uh, there are others, there's sand dunes, there's uh, alpine areas at the tops of mountains, uh, there are certain wildlife critters, uh, plovers, and, and other, other animals that create areas that are also protected. Um, but I'll touch on the big three, the wetland streams and vernal pools. Um, a wetland is tough because uh, it takes a wetland scientist to really know if it's a wetland. Right. If you look at a swamp and I look at a swamp, we can both agree that the swamp is a wetland. But what <laughs> class of wetland is it? Does it have setbacks? How important is that wetland? Uh, if I touch that wetland, do I need one permit or the other? You see, that's where the, the question mark comes in. And there are a lot of areas that a layman would look at it and say, well, that's not a, a wetland. That's just a little patch of ferns or something. And we can go in and we have the, the scientific understanding. And so does DEP. If you have a question, you can call DEP. They'll come out and look at it too. Uh, and, and you can determine whether or not it's actually a wetland. There's soils, there's plants, and there's other criteria to whether or not something is a wetland and it's high value and low value wetland they have different functions and values and they're regulated by both Maine DEP and the Army Corps of Engineers and right. their permits do not match so there's things you can get away with with the DEP that you can't with the Army Corps and the stuff that the Army Corps doesn't care about but the DEP does so and is, there, is there a length of time that it takes like if you, you're fairly certain that your property has some kind of wetland. And so, you know, you need to have someone, you know, yourself or the DEP or both come out and take a look at it. And then the Army Corps, um, you know, is, is there a length of time that it takes for them to kind of get through there in your experience? Like, are you, are you talking months? Are you talking, you know, it, it depends on the tier structure of the, you know, wetland permit that you you know need to have so like does somebody need to prepare a year in advance so if i want to build this summer it's probably off the table but uh it depends on what you want to do and it depends on what you're doing uh and it depends on who you talk to it's more fluid than that 
But yeah. right now you're doing pretty good if you can get someone from the DEP and the Army Corps to schedule a meeting within a, within a month or two. Okay. Um, they're busy folks and the economy is booming. So yep. um, it, it's hard to get them out there. Um, private companies such as ourselves and others, um, they have people that you can schedule and go out and look at those. Uh, and so, yeah, you want, if you're trying to do a land project, a house, six months, probably enough time. If you're trying to do some sort of commercial development, you want a year uh, ahead of time if you can, um, because it takes, it takes some time. Um, wetlands can be uh, checked anytime that we can see the ground. So they're pretty hard under six feet of snow. Uh, but uh, if we can see the ground, we can usually delineate wetlands and do functions and values. Uh, and the rules are set up so that we should be the same line in May as it is in August. Okay. So the reality is, uh, you know, August the line's going to be in one spot, and, and in, in May it's going to be somewhere else. But uh, you can really, you, you can get pretty close regardless of that season. Sure. Uh, streams. Streams have uh, five criteria. Um, but pretty much anything that has a mineral bottom, so like the topsoil was eroded off by the stream, yep. uh, you can pretty much bet that that's probably a regulatory stream. And there's no width requirement. So if that thing's only 12 inches wide, it could be a stream. You need a right. wetland scientist or an environmental scientist to go in and check that and, and find out if it's a regulatory stream. And the tough part with streams is that uh, you need, you need uh, a 75-foot setback, no touch right. on either side. Um, and, and sometimes up to 100 feet. And that's, that's, a, a, that's a big swath of land. So yeah, if you it could have a three, major impact on your development. Yeah, uh, we have seen pieces of property that were otherwise gonna make a great 14 lot subdivision um, completely taken off the market because there was a stream, a stream, these are streams that you step over without, without really even noticing it, um, but there's a stream, a regulatory stream every 100 to 150 feet. When you do a 75 foot setback on those, all of the property is protected. Yeah. There was so little left over that they eventually just sold it as a woodlot. Um, now I'm not gonna, I, you know, I have opinions on whether that's right or wrong uh, because the devil in the regulatory world, the devil's always in the details. Right. So I wanna protect streams, you wanna protect streams. It's what is a stream, that, that's the hard part. The timing component of what you were, you were referring to is about vernal pools. Yeah. A vernal pool is a naturally occurring a pool that that ponds up in the springtime only. So if it's ponded up all year long, it's not a vernal pool. Yep. If it has a stream coming in or out, it's not a vernal pool. Unlike a wetland or a stream, if it's man-made, it's not a vernal pool. So the rules yeah. there, whether it's man-made or not, change depending on what kind of resource it is. Yeah. Um, depending on a lot of it was depending on who was in charge when the rules were written. Uh, it's a political function. Uh, and it does make a difference too, right? Um, if the subdivision, so say you have a piece of property that's in a subdivision, and maybe the subdivision is from the 80s and this piece of property just never got developed. Um, depending on the town or where you're at, you maybe can go back to whatever the rules were when the development was done, or you still have to follow, you know, whatever today's rules are, and too bad if they're more strict now than they were in 1980. If you go in and ask permission for a project, they'll make you use the most current rules. Okay. You have a modification you want to make to an existing subdivision, and say, and you go in and you want to make that modification, at least in the modification area, they will make you use the new rules. Okay. And they have the right to make you update the entire project to the new rules. But if you have a project that was approved back in 1980s and you're buying a lot, uh, you should be good with that approval. That was grandfathered in. Yeah. That's normally the way it is. Every town, every municipality, they're going to have a different, a different criteria. So you do want to talk to your code enforcement officers. Sure. Uh, the trick with vernal pools is they can only be identified at a certain time of year. And that time of year is right now. Uh, it is from sometime in April to sometime in May, depending on the year, depending on the weather. Uh, and what we're looking for there is whether or not there's water. We're looking for certain animal species. There's a salamander, there's a frog, and there's a shrimp that floats around in the water too. <laughs> shrimp. Uh, seriously, yeah, yeah, they call the fairy shrimp. Um, and, uh, they have to go in and they have to net them up and look to see if these critters live in there. And then if the critter lives in there, then we've got something that's an actual vernal pool. Mm -hmm. Tough part with vernal pools is they have big time setbacks. Army Corps requires a 250 foot setback on those. Right. So that's a, that's a significant uh, 
they give any back to your land. Yeah. Shoreland, you have other rules. You got, you got uh, dune stuff, the stuff on the coast they have to deal with, but those are the, the, the main resources. Yeah. We do a little bit of shoreland zoning. Um, and the biggest thing, you know, for us in the shoreland is what's within a hundred feet of, uh, you know, the ocean or the really lovely lake because Maine is full of water and people like to live on the water. And um, there's always a kind of common misconception, and I'm sure that you find this more than, than we do, is that you can do whatever you want on your property. Uh, not so much true. <laughs> uh, I, I am, I, there's a balance. This is my little talk on this. I just gave it yesterday to an intern. There's, there's a, a balance between uh, having a clean environment that we enjoy yep. and owning property and having rights to that. Uh, you own the land, but if a deer comes onto your property from offsite, wanders around on your property and leaves your site, does that deer belong to you while it's on your land? And I don't think anyone would say it does unless it's November. Uh, that deer belongs to the state of Maine. Right. Um, if a stream comes down onto your property, when the stream enters your land, that water that's in that stream, is that yours while it's there? Or or does that belong to someone else? Do you have the right to dump a barrel of hazardous chemicals uh, onto your land? Right. It's your land. Do you have the right to dump those? I think most reasonable people would say no, because that, that pollutant is going to enter the groundwater and then flow over to your neighbor's well. Right, it's going to go somewhere. Exactly. So, so yeah, there's this balance uh, on the environmental protection compared to land on the right. Uh, I am personally of the opinion that that balance has shifted too far. The pendulum swung too far, and I try to defend the landowner's rights to what they can and can't do with their land. I feel like, like they're being pushed too far. Right. Um, I'm in the minority. Uh, I'm, I don't mind that. Uh, so be it. Um, and so what happens with the shoreland zoning is there are rules set up that are designed to, uh, at least ostensibly designed to protect the environment. And that's what the shoreland zones are there for. And, and yeah, there's, there's no quicker way to gain attention than to start up a chainsaw on a lakefront uh, on a Sunday afternoon. Yep. You will suddenly have 20 boats with video cameras uh, floating just offshore to see what you're doing. Uh, so you got to be really careful on the on the shoreland stuff, um, and uh, and there are restrictions, um, such as of course you got that 100 feet from the front from the from the from the shoreline, and then most shoreland zones extend 250 feet from the waterfront, uh, from that high water mark, uh, and there's limited what you can do between the 100 foot and the 250 foot mark. Yeah. Uh, and there's special rules for septic systems within within shoreland zones, uh, and there's special buffers. And then if you have something that's within that 100 feet, expanding it has special rules. Yeah. Um, so so that's, a, that's an interesting, uh, interesting thing. With the shoreland zone rules, they're actually all proposed by and, and required by the state, but the state has a law that says you can't have statewide zoning. So the state said, well, we can't have shoreland zoning, but we're gonna make it a law requiring all the towns to have shoreland zoning and that's how we have shoreland zones. Uh, and the effect of that is that the shoreland zoning language looks very similar from town to town, but yeah. they may not all be exactly the same. Do they have to adopt a shoreland zoning that was uh, sort of provided by the DEP, or does the DEP have their own zoning and then the town has zoning and whichever one is more stringent is whatever you have to follow? The DEP does not have zoning per se. They have the Natural Resource Protection Act. So they have certain setback requirements from any waterfront. Right. And it's the same as for streams, 75 feet. Any work within 25 feet requires a full NRPA permit. Uh, and if you're working in the water, it requires an NRPA permit. So say you're putting in a permanent pier uh, or a boat ramp or something like that on your property, that requires an NRPA uh, permit through the main, main DEP. But as for that, what happens on the land outside of that 75 foot mark, that's really part of the shoreland zoning rules. DEP provides that language, then the towns have to adopt them. Okay. And some towns adopt them and make them more strict, restrictive. Yep. Some towns adopt them as proposed by the DEP. And some towns uh, say, no, we're gonna try to make it easier. And they do, uh, some of them, 
are still working with shoreline zone uh, uh, ordinances that were in place in the 1980s. They just never updated them. Uh, and there's actually a couple of towns that just said DDP, no, sorry, heck with you, sue us if you really want us to. And yeah, and sometimes that happens too. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, they, they're just because it's shoreline zoning, you think it's the same throughout the state. It's not. There's fine uh, details that are different from town to town. So you have to look at the town ordinances on those. Yeah. So. So we've been chatting for about 25 minutes. We have about five more minutes. Is there anything yeah. else? I think I feel like uh, you know maybe we, we did natural resources. We touched a little bit on septic, but is there anything else that, uh, that you really kind of want to highlight on that higher level? And again, uh, like we said, we were just kind of glossing over the top surface here of things that you could think about. So uh, anybody who's listening to the podcast, if you have some specific questions, I'd be happy to have Bob or you know somebody in each of us in individual departments. Uh, pop back on and give more detailed information on uh, anything that people have a lot more questions about so well I'll, I'll talk um, briefly about septic systems because uh, any kind of podcast is just not complete without poop so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's right. so septic systems uh, any, any place that's not municipal sewer, you're required to put in a septic system. That's not optional. Um, there's, there's really no other options. If you don't have municipal, you really need a septic system. Um, and, and let's face it, you want that, right? Because you don't want the alternative. Um, I guess the big thing I want to mention there is they're designed by a professional. They're installed by a licensed contractor. There's all sorts of them out there. If you want more information, you can go to our website. We have at uh, www.main-landdci.com. And, uh, and we have all sorts of information about septic system designs. The critical part here with septic system is to maintain them. Uh, don't set it and forget it, right? This isn't an infomercial. So you need to, <laughs> you need to, call, you need to call a uh, septic system maintainer every couple, couple three years. Uh, and you don't have to do this yourself. So, you know, you don't need uh, shoulder length rubber gloves to deal with this. You just call, make a phone call. It costs like 200 to $300. They come out and they deal with the whole thing. Um, but they clean out your tank, they check your system, etc. Uh, you want to do that every few years. Do not let that slide. Um, and then lastly, flood zones. I don't want to touch on flood zones just briefly uh, because flood insurance has gotten even more expensive. Uh, and it's a requirement for any piece of property that even touches an area that's part of a flood zone, whether or not it's actually at risk of, of your structures at risk of flooding. Um, that's actually federal rules and it's really expensive. I've, we've gotten reports recently of people paying two, three thousand dollars every year for flood insurance. They've been doing that for five or six years and then when we check their house elevation compared to where the flood is, it turns out they didn't never need it. Yeah. So if you have a question about that, also check our website, uh, call Emily uh, and we can set you up and check that out. Uh, there's a lot of money going to flood insurance, it's just not necessary. Yeah, we've definitely done that. I know um, it was a couple years ago uh, when we were sitting on the, uh, when I was sitting on the city of Auburn's uh, planning board and FEMA changed all of the flood maps and um, it was going to change so that all of Taylor Pond was going to be in the flood zone. And so, um, which was kind of crazy because half of it is like up on a hill and <laughs> you know, it's, down, it's down low or and the town actually, I think, argued with FEMA on where that flood zone was, but it was going to require everybody to, to have flood insurance and that was one of those times where we called uh, and said hey can you come do a bunch of elevation surveys like I want to know where you know where this this property is where's the first floor level and okay we understand that you know we no longer can have a heating system in our basement that might be below you know below the flood flood zone but that our first floor plane is you know well above it and, and um, so that was kind of a really interesting thing for us you know to go through was like you know, all of a sudden we had a bunch of homeowners that had houses that had never been in the flood zone before and and had you know gotten a letter in the mail you know the sort of scary letter like you're gonna do flood insurance and you know they call and they're like how much is flood insurance oh it's you know several grand a year and, the, and all of a sudden it gets a, a whole lot less cost effective to own a piece of property anywhere near water so. yes that's right which and all of this is a function of katrina uh the government and uh homeowners and financial institutions lost so much money from a katrina that's where this all stems from yeah. Lakes, lakes in particular are 
you are probably don't need, some do, but most houses around a lake don't need flood insurance and are being required to do it. Rivers, you might need it, you might not. And if you do need it, by all means, have it, right? Yeah. And you don't want that risk. But. For sure. Well, and then, you know, it was kind of interesting too, is, is there are some lakes, uh, you know, especially in the state of Maine, that are a water source for uh, different towns and municipalities where they actually control the level of the lake. And it, at what point in the flood zone do, is, do they just open the floodgate and let it go? Right, so. right. So anyway, that's something that homeowners are being hit with uh, in the last five years. That flood insurance. Yep. So, fascinating. It's always cool. Uh, you know, this is, I love, um, for us, we try to practice, uh, we try to practice. That was my timer. That's uh, 30 minutes because you know me. <laughs> So we could spend all day just talking about whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, for us, it's it's really important. We practice integrated design, so we bring the surveyor in in the beginning. We know where the house is going to be. You know, we work with the contractors to do the most, and so it's always a pleasure to have people who are really experienced in their field. You know, land. That's probably one of the things. I know enough to be dangerous and not anything else. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's always great to have, have someone like yourself join us on the podcast and talk about it. And again, if anybody has questions or they want more specific answers about it, um, we absolutely will do more podcasts uh, on this topic. And I will make sure there's a link to your website in the show notes so that anybody awesome. who's following on here can just click on the show notes and get right to your website. So, um, thank you for being on. We appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to seeing more of you in the future. Sounds great, Emily. Thank you so much. Yeah.